you don't want to. If you like the idea, though, you can help me out. If you love your Uncle Sam, bring him home. Bring him home. Support our boys in Vietnam. Bring him home. Bring him home. It'll make our general sad, I know. Bring him home. Bring him home. They want to tangle with the foe. Bring him home. Bring him home. Here is their big fallacy. Bring them home, bring them home. They'll have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love Sing this song, bring on home, bring on home. Now there's one thing I will confess, bring on home, bring home. I'm not really a pacifist, bring on home, bring on home. If an army invaded this land of mine, bring on home, home. you find me out on the firing line, bring on home, bring on home. Even if they drop their planes to bomb, bring them home, home. Though they brought helicopters and a bomb, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your Uncle Sam, support our boys in Vietnam, bring them home, bring them home. Yes, show these generals their fallacy. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring them home, home, home. And when in a few universal rules, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle to sing on this. Good evening. Um, now I just have to get back to the screen. Good evening. Uh, I'm John McAuliffe, the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Uh, tonight is... I think the 32nd webinar that we have done in a series of trying to capture the history of the anti-war movement and the post-war movement to address war legacies uh, while we're still here to talk about it. Um, all of these programs are available on YouTube, we hope into the indefinite future. Uh, and you will see in the chat page uh a the link back to the bios if you haven't read them and also a link for donations which we desperately need to to keep this in action so i'm now going to turn it over to susan hammond um among her many attributes is that for many years she was the engine within the vietnam within the fund for reconciliation and development that kept us working on many projects. And then she went off to found the War Legacies Project. So Susan, it's all yours. And uh, oh, I wanted to say, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. The chat is open, but do not put questions there. We won't look at them. Only questions that are in the Q&A will get responded to. Susan, it's all yours. 
Thank you very much, Charles, and welcome everyone to the uh, webinar on um, Asian Orange and Under Unfinished War Legacy. There's a lot of aspects about the Asian Orange issue um, that we will touch upon some of them tonight. Unfortunately, in 90 minutes, we can't cover that this whole very complex story. Um, but hopefully in the discussion, we'll get into some of the um, topics that we didn't raise. Um, as John said, put your questions in the Q&A and please make them brief so that we can get to as many questions as possible. As John said, I'm the founder of the and the executive director of the War Legacies Project. And even though I wasn't old enough to be marching in the streets during the Vietnam War, and I also spent eight years of my early the Vietnam War years on a military base, which probably would have frowned upon that. Um, but I, my organization is a direct descendant of the war legacy uh, of the anti-war movement. As John said, that I um, worked for him um, for many years in, in New York at the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. And I found John after I had been to Vietnam in 1991, because I wanted to find out for myself what it was about the country and the region that sent um, our country to war, my father in particular, for, um, for two, three years of my life, basically. Um, so when I moved back to New York, I found John and that that brought me into um, the war legacy issues. It brought me into um, introducing me to many of the people who are on this call tonight, um, people who are part of the anti-war movement. And it also very importantly brought me in contact with Jackie Shenyang, who is going to speak um, tonight about our work in Laos, um, who, for full disclosure, she is also the president of, of the War Legacies Project. Um, and it was also through the Fund for Reconciliation and Development that I met Sally and Steve Nichols, um, who through their Chino Cienega Foundation was the were able to financially help me fund the um, found the War Legacies Project and and with John's blessing continue this work. I was also been very grateful that through my work I've met Chuck Cersei, who is profiled in the book. If you haven't read it yet, The Long Reckoning that George Black um, wrote, that um, has, is a very good way to uh, get some of the background on this, on the Agent Orange issue and the reconciliation um, with Vietnam. And then I also thankfully got to meet Heather Bowser through my work. Um, as you can see, we're all very connected on this, this panel. Um, and she has taught me so much about the part of this issue that I really have not had a lot of time to work on, which is the impact Agent Orange has had on children of veterans. So for no further ado, I'm going to let um, George begin our talk tonight to give a little, and then we'll kind of bounce around a little bit between George and Heather, back to George, to me, then Jackie. So go ahead, George. Thank you, Susan. And thanks, John, for putting this together. And it's always good to see the rest of you. Um, I'm kind of a Johnny come lately to this one. In one sense, um, I guess I was on the streets in London in 1968 outside the US Embassy. So maybe in that sense, I'm an old timer. But this is an issue really I've come to in the last 10 years in this country and traveling to Vietnam. I'm assuming obviously everyone who's on this call is likely to have some basics, but I'm going to risk starting with the real basics on Agent Orange because sometimes they seem obvious, we forget them. And I think some of the things I think are basic maybe are less well known or less well thought about. Um, and I think they'll be relevant to some of the questions that may come up. They'll also be particularly relevant, I think, to, to Heather and to Susan as the children of veterans, because I'll, I'll get to the specifics, but I think there may be one or two new ideas in here to think about. The first thing I always say about Agent Orange is that it is a unique story, unique in the history of warfare, unique in the history of the consequences of war, unique in the way that we think about warfare technology and the places, the natural environments where war is fought. I mean, it was the first time that a military power had ever used chemical technology um, really to lay waste to a country's environmental infrastructure, uh, forests in, in the interest of pursuing a military victory. 
And I think that is, to me, the big picture of the war, and it's the big picture that really drives the first part of my book, The Long Reckoning, which is this was a war between machinery and terrain. Technology, including chemistry and, and Vietnam's natural advantages in war, mountains and forests. Um, just as a basic refresher, Agent Orange was only one of a whole suite of chemicals that were used in Vietnam, uh, familiarly known as the rainbow chemicals because they were painted with a, a band of color on the 55-gallon drums that contained them. There was orange, white, blue, pink, and green. Orange accounted for about 62% of all of them. They all had slightly different chemical compositions. They all had slightly different purposes, overlapping. Uh, green and pink were early manifestations, then came orange. Um, orange, white, and to an extent purple were really the three, well, orange, orange, white, blue, and, and purple, really the four biggest of the six. They were all different chemical mixtures. And in the case of Agent Orange, it was, I won't bore you with chemical data and uh, acronyms and numbers, but a composition of two chemicals, one of which contained a trace, a tiny trace element of dioxin, usually regarded as the most toxic substance ever invented by humans. And the problem with Agent Orange is that when the demand for it on the battlefield increased and production levels were ramped up, very rapidly by the Pentagon starting in 1966, the production controls went haywire. The manufacturing companies uh, ceased to exercise proper quality control on the temperature of the chemical process, and the amount of dioxin was massively uh, increased in that process, which is what makes Agent Orange so particularly lethal. People always say, well, they were used for two purposes in Vietnam. I would say they were used for three. And the third is the one that doesn't get talked about very much. And I think, as I said, is relevant to Heather's experience, to Susan's experience, and to the many veterans who were affected. The two main purposes of Agent Orange, one was to defoliate, to remove forest cover, to expose the enemy to attack from the air. And the other was to destroy food crops, which was much more controversial. It also involved a great deal of the use of Agent Blue, which was a very different chemical compound. It was an arsenical compound, and it was applied to kill food crops. Very, very controversial, very much opposed by the Kennedy administration in the early days, very much urged upon Kennedy by the South Vietnamese government. Um, so those were the two main uses, crop destruction and removal of forest cover. The third, which I always think gets neglected, is that the essential purpose in the beginning was to defoliate the edges of roads, railways, uh, waterways through the Mekong Delta, and American military bases and facilities. It was a security measure to give a zone of visibility where you couldn't be ambushed, you couldn't be subject to surprise attack. And I think the neglected element of the discussion to me is always the spraying of bases, the spraying of base perimeters. You gotta remember that about 80% of the Americans who served in Vietnam did not see combat. They were, forgive my language, but it is what they called them. They were referred to as the rear echelon motherfuckers. The REMFs, they served on the bases. They were the engineers, they were the builders, they were the accountants, uh, the people who kept the trucks moving, the nurses, the dog handlers on the bases. All of these people who were the great majority, they were constantly exposed through their presence on the bases, more than the troops in the field, to the relentless spraying of the perimeter to give a clear field of fire and to avoid ambushes. Bear that in mind, because I think it's really important in thinking about the experience of veterans and veterans' children. Um, the biggest irony of the campaign is that from a military point of view, 
it was essentially a fiasco. Uh, one of the first American scientists, and I want to talk a bit about the way in which American scientists and Vietnamese scientists, and then later Canadian scientists, came together to address the problem of Agent Orange, in large part through the presence they had at the activities organized over many years by the Fund for Reconciliation and Development, John, Susan, and others uh, who brought people together uh, to discuss the problem in a, in a cooperative international fashion. One of the first American scientists who went to study Agent Orange was a geneticist from Harvard called Matthew Messelson. He went on behalf, he went as did several others on behalf of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, during the war. And their main concern actually at that point was the ecological impact. The first scientists who really got onto this from an American point of view were foresters, zoologists, um, environmental experts who were concerned about the impact on the forests and on wildlife. And then of course, on human health, primarily in that first period as a result of exposure to arsenic because of the food crops being sprayed with Agent Blue, the arsenical compound. So in 1970, this scientist, Matt Messelson from Harvard, went to interview after he'd been into the field, been allowed to go out on a spraying mission with the Air Force. He went to see the Supreme Commander of American Forces in Vietnam, General Creighton Abrams, William Westmoreland's successor. And he said, tell me honestly, General, what do you think of this defoliation program? And Abrams said to him, you know what I think of it? It's shit. And Messelson was startled and he said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, my son would tell you the same thing. My son's an infantry officer in the Central Highlands. It's worthless. Later, another army general called Douglas Kennard questionnaired all of his uh, fellow generals who had served in Vietnam about whether the tactic of using Agent Orange had actually been effective. And a large number of them said, no, it was absolutely worthless, except for protecting base perimeters and maybe things like defoliating the canals in the Mekong Delta, because that really actually did protect you from ambush. But in general, he said, because of the way Agent Orange worked, it takes weeks to take effect. He said it was like dropping a postcard in enemy held territory saying, dear enemy, we're about to drop poisonous chemicals on you. We'll be back in several weeks when all the leaves will have fallen off the trees and we'll be able to bomb you then. So of course the enemy would move on. It took until 2003 for there to be a fairly accurate scientific analysis of just how much uh, Agent Orange, how many other chemicals were used in Vietnam. They were calculated in the end by a Columbia University occupational health specialist called Gene Stellman, who calculated that based on about 85% correct or complete military records, 20 million gallons had been dropped of all the rainbow chemicals. 62% of them were Agent Orange. Between 2.1 million and 4.8 million Vietnamese had been exposed to the chemicals and that they had covered a ground area, a surface area the size of Massachusetts. Which raises the basic problem that really the whole subsequent discussion of Agent Orange is about. Given the magnitude of that, the number of people, the acreage, the millions upon millions of gallons, how could you get a handle on it? How could you deal with the impacts, the environmental impact, the human health impact for Americans, the human health impact, the Vietnamese. And that's a long saga. It, it took many, many years. I'm going to jump way ahead because I want to bring Heather in quickly while we're talking about, uh, about this particular early period where the problem was measured, because what was never measured scientifically was how many Americans had been exposed because of the great mythology of Agent Orange 
which was before they did a spraying mission, they checked out to make sure no American troops were in the field in that area. It was only designed to be applied to the enemy, so no one worried about it being applied to Americans. The problem is that it was, and not just because of the base perimeter spraying to which so many were constantly exposed. The great advocate for the Air Force, a scientist called Alvin Young, who is the, for decades, the top toxicologist for the US Air Force, has always insisted American troops were never exposed. There's no problem here. When I was going through Al Young's papers, personal papers at the um, US Department of Agriculture, I found a map, a little drawn map of Agent Orange spraying missions over an area right on the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, where one of the major characters in my book, a Marine called Manus Campbell, had been stationed at the end of 1967. And it shows spray runs passing over Manus's positions within 500 meters of fixed American positions. And I will add there parenthetically that one of the exposure risks of Agent Orange is what they call spray drift. You lay the stuff down in a line, but it spreads. It's carried on the wind. It disperses anything from five to 10 kilometers from the spray line that you will see on an Air Force map. So that was a lie. American soldiers were directly exposed. But of course, the exposure was nothing on the magnitude that Vietnamese civilians and Vietnamese fighters were exposed to. And during that period when the first American scientists were going in, and the first American veterans in the latter year of the years of the war and the first years after were beginning to experience birth defects in their offspring, miscarriages in their wives, cancers and other diseases in themselves. The Vietnamese had been experiencing this throughout the war. And people sometimes say when I wrote this book, was there anything about it looking back that made me particularly angry? And I said, well, no, I don't think anger is often a useful emotion. But the one thing that does make me angry still is that the Vietnamese scientists who worked on this and who were documenting the effects on the environment, on public health, on the returning veterans on their side, on the children, the offspring of their veterans, were dismissed well into the, into the 2000s after diplomatic normalization took place as propagandists, as liars, as extortionists, as communists trying to discredit the United States. And these were world-renowned scientists. When you read descriptions from American diplomats through those years of the, of the Vietnamese science, it's emotionalism, it's propaganda. <clears throat> Their leading member, a very, very distinguished liver specialist, because liver cancer is one of the first places that Agent Orange showed up in those early days. <clears throat> Dr. Ton Tat Tung, a world-renowned liver scientist, he had published during the war years articles on liver disease in The Lancet, the great British medical journal. And he had a legion of people whom he trained who were his acolytes, Men like Le Cao Dai, who was a celebrated doctor who ran a field hospital in the Central Highlands during the war, treated many young soldiers suffering from liver cancer. A wonderful young woman called Nguyen Thi Ngoc Tuan, whose husband was actually the commanding officer of North Vietnamese forces at Khe San. She was a disciple of, uh, of Tong Tat Tung. These were world-class scientists. So yeah, that part makes me angry. Um, there's a lot more I could say, but I just wanted to set the stage about the Vietnamese and American scientists and how over the years that followed, as each of the aspects of the problem had to be addressed and solved, the human health aspect for Americans, for Vietnamese, the dioxin contamination in the environment, that collaboration is really central to understanding how that has unfolded. I'll stop there. Let me pass it over to Heather, perhaps, and then I and Susan and others can come back in, in a little while. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. And George, that was a absolute um, amazing uh, introduction to what Agent Orange is and, and the ability to put it into a words in a way that I haven't actually heard much of before, which is the idea that um, trying to dispel the myths the idea is that um, if you were on, if only if you were in uh, combat or in the jungle that you would be uh, exposed. I feel like so many veterans, it took a very, very long time for anyone to understand that. So I, I appreciate you bringing that to, to light. Um, my name is Heather Bowser, and I am the daughter of a Vietnam vet who has passed. And I'm going to put my... I'm going to share my slides here. Let's see. All right. I don't know. So, okay. So uh, my name is Heather Bowser. I am the daughter of Vietnam vet and his wife, my mother, Sharon Morris. My father's name was Bill. Um, and I joke that 10 fingers are overrated because, um, due to my father's exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam, I have multiple birth effects and including several of my fingers. So those of you who have 10, I don't know why you need them all. Um, I've done quite well. Thank you. Um, so my parents, I'm just going to jump right in because I think a lot of you, um, uh, would like to just get into the story to understand more quickly. Uh, this is my mother and father. Uh, they were married nine days before my dad left for Vietnam. They had met in college and my mother had a roommate that was from my father's hometown. And when my father came to, uh, into to college, he stopped by his old classmates uh, dorm room and met my mother. Um, they dated while they were in college, and then uh, my dad was uh, one semester away from becoming a CPA, and he decided that he told my mother that everyone who he knew whose father was an accountant was a real bore, so he was going to quit quit um, college and, uh, and go home and go back to the steel mill. And my mother begged him not to because she said, Bill, you'll be drafted. And his number was coming up. And when his number was getting closer, he went in and um, enlisted for three years because they said with his accounting background, they would probably keep him stateside. So you know how that went. That doesn't last. Um, my father was in uh, Vietnam from 1968 to 1969, and it was um, the year of the heaviest sprayed uh, amounts of Agent Orange at that time. So George already covered what is Agent Orange, um, and I'll pass on this. And this is kind of like a map, kind of similar to what uh, George was talking about. This is South Vietnam, and these are uh, the spraying missions for uh, Agent Orange sorties that would come out of various air. Ports. Um, one would be in the north and the other one was Benoit down in, more in the south where my father was. So Operation Ranch Hand was the Agent Orange spraying mission that came out of Benoit Air Base. Um, this is where it was uh, stationed. And if you look at my picture there, uh, Long Bin Base over to the right, that's where my father was uh, stationed. That is um, and uh, it was the biggest, largest army depot outside of the United States at its time. It's in the Dong Nai province, which is one of the heaviest sprayed areas outside of the Mekong Delta and the DMZ. Um, if you look at this, you can see the large arrow at the top. That's the Benoit airstrip. And if you um, can see uh, Long Bin over there, and then you see this waterway that runs up through there. Um, at what we have heard from different um, veterans that we've discussed with is that Benoit had pilots, they were instructed not to bring anything back in their 
um, planes and uh, this and they would drop it in their uh, into the waterways right alongside not and also spraying uh, the base as well. But so this gentleman said, you know, if you showered, you showered in Agent Orange. If you wore clothes, you wore Agent Orange. If you drank tea, coffee or milk um, and if you ate any vegetables, you ate Agent Orange. So this myth that you had to be in the jungle for it to happen wasn't true. Uh, Benoit was on Benoit Air Base was only 13 miles outside of uh, Long Ben. So also the Army also reused stock. I'm sure many who have known that they have reused things. And so a lot of times the barrels would be cleaned out, washed out, and refilled. Um, this was from a... Uh, 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 one of the articles in, um, I'm sorry, which I uh, can't remember which actually it's, maybe it says it down the bottom here. Yeah, the VVA veteran in 2020, in 2012, um, that basically that the water sat in there for uh, over the day and then the men would come home at, in the evening and shower out of water that had been stored in dioxin laden barrels. This is what dioxin does. This is like a beautiful. And this is a picture that I took um, when I was in Vietnam several years ago. Um, and you can see basically the difference of what the defoliation does. This is recent. Um, and this is another thing that happened quite frequently, you know, hurry up and wait of war. And that is basically using what you got. So here are people cutting barrels in half, taking baths. Is there, you know, barbecues, showers, that kind of stuff. So... Again, George, I really do appreciate you bringing that to light. So let's get, let's fast forward real quick. So my dad came home from Vietnam. He was, um, he was stationed back into Fort Lewis when he came home. He was called home a few months early because his father had had a heart attack. Um, and so he came home a few months early. They thought they'd get him close to Ohio and they put him in Washington state because that makes all the sense of the military. Um, so my parents really wanted to have a big family. So when they, when my dad got back, the idea was that I was just going to, uh, that they were going to start their family, move on, put the war behind them. Unfortunately, my mom had two miscarriages before me. And then I was born in 1972. I was uh, two months premature. I weighed three pounds, four ounces, and I was missing my right leg um, and my big toe and my left foot. And like I talked in the beginning, several of my fingers and my parents hadn't did not have any idea what had happened that would cause um, their daughter to be born this way. Uh, I was a complete surprise for that to happen, considering there was no ultrasounds or anything at that point. Um, basically, my mother was afraid that she was having another miscarriage. She went into the hospital. She said, I think I'm in labor and they said it was too early and hello world here comes <laughs> here I came and I was quite a surprise uh, my mother said she remembers the nurses saying oh my god and a mask coming on over her face and she woke up with my father beside her bedside saying that she that I'm sorry Sharon but she's damaged um and I will so when I, I'm kind of going through some old slides, so apologize. I apologize if I skip over. Um, but my parents made the decision really early not to try to um, disable me further than um, I already was facing in my life. You know, in the hospital, the, the nurses and the doctors told my parents they didn't know whether I would survive. They didn't know whether I was as messed up on the inside as I was on the outside. They weren't very kind to my parents. They asked my parent. Uh, they they asked my mother what she had done to her baby. Um, a man that worked with my father asked what they were going to do with me, put me down, um, and my father caught a nurse calling me an it in the hospital. But for six weeks of my life, I was not allowed to be held. I could not be. Um, moved around too much because in that time, you know, they didn't have the science of premature babies and what to do with that. So uh, it was kind of a rough beginning.
And my friend is getting as far as so my parents um found out from a Paul Rubishin on the Today Show that said that he had died in Vietnam and hadn't known it. And then he was a young man that ended up dying of stomach cancer shortly after returning from Vietnam. Um, my parents found out about it. And at this point in time, my mother had another miscarriage, but then she had my brother, John, who you can see in the picture, picture there. And we became Agent Orange activists. So during this time in my life, I'm a pretty young kid and um, we have people from New York coming. There's local newspapers and that kind of stuff. And at that point in time, my father was a part of the DAV. He was involved in the Steelworkers Union. We would do a lot of things to try to bring awareness to veterans issues. Unfortunately, my father um, did not survive Vietnam as well as in in part as he could have. Uh, as that you know, as we learn more and more, we start to understand the trauma of war. And my father wasn't the same person that came home that went to war, especially according to my mother. She said that even though uh, they met for R and R once in Hawaii while he was on, um, while he was in Vietnam for R and R for their honeymoon. And he, she said that by the time that he, she be, she saw him again, he was very hyper vigilant, was very watchful, very skittish. It was really hard for her, um, even at that very early point in time. Um, my father had PTSD. He struggled with depression. He struggled with anxiety. He struggled with um, his environment. He always wanted to have control. He never traveled. He said things like, you know, I did my traveling and I won't be traveling anymore. Um, so these kinds of things, this is this is a picture of Agent Orange. This painting is a painting of Agent Orange leaving from Vietnam and coming into my life. This is a self-portrait that I painted when I was trying to come to grips with my life and the struggle that my family and um, I had been through as a child and into young adult. This is something that I painted in college. Um, and this is really showing just the idea that this came out from a place that is far from me, but now it is affecting my life. Um, my father began to have problems with his heart and when he, in 1986, he had five bypasses when he was 38 years old. At age 40, he developed uncontrollable diabetes. At 48, he had a stroke. And at age 50, he died of a massive heart attack. All the while, even through in 1986, my father filed a VA claim. It wasn't until getting Senator Sherrod Brown, who unfortunately lost his seat um, in this last election, to um, push his claim was finally recognized for my mother in 2011. So my father had died in 1998 and my mother was finally, her, his claim from 1986 was finally settled. Um, we bury our mistakes, the famous Vietnam or Veterans Administration. So my life has been filled with times of um, great grief, great anger, great frustration, um, sadness, but I've also had a lot of joy and happiness with learning um, to meet other people who have had the same issues that I've had with dealing with Agent Orange in the people of Vietnam and also my fellow peers of um, children of Vietnam veterans. These are some early documents of of the activism my parents was, in, or was involved in. These are other times when I've been to uh, Okinawa when they found Agent Orange on the soccer pitch just outside of a DOD school several years ago. This was on my first trip to Vietnam. I was in a meeting and I saw a picture of this boy's hand on some pictures in the meeting room. And I asked if this little boy was there. And they said, yeah, he's here. Um, his name is Bang. Um, and uh, I said, can I get a picture with him? Because this little boy living in Vietnam, this is his fingers, these are mine. These are some kids of Vietnam vets. Um, at one point in time, I was the founder, co-founder of a group called Children of Vietnam Veterans Health Alliance. Unfortunately, we did not survive the pandemic, not to mention putting a bunch of children of Vietnam veterans in one bag and shaking it up as like, uh, 
cats with, and it was a bunch of rocking chairs, right? We all, that's almost the only thing we have in common. This is a man who had a pituitary tumor. He really struggled. He had tons of issues. This is another uh, friend of mine born with hip dysplasia, which is uh, a common birth defect caused by dioxin in children of women Vietnam veterans as well. This is Jen Loney. She is, was born without her arm. And this is a picture of her in the um, museum in Vietnam, the War Remnant Museum. This is Josh. Uh, he is a part, was a part of our group as well. He went with to Vietnam with us. He's missing both arms and his leg. And he, um, his father also served in Vietnam. And these are, of course, the kids of Vietnam. And with that, I would like to go ahead and end. Um, so I'll be happy to answer questions at the at the end. Thank you very much, Heather. And we're going to jump back to George real quick so he can give a, a bit of a summary of, okay, this is uh, where we are now and how we got to this point, starting with the environmental aspects of this issue. George, you're muted. Yeah, better. Um, yeah, I'll keep this quite short. As I said, the the question that loomed over this issue for, for decades um, is how could you get a handle on it? Because it was so massive, it was so unprecedented, it was so diffuse, it was everywhere. And that really was always a fallback excuse when politicians didn't want to do anything to address it. You know, they denied it on many, many levels. Um, you also can't prove categorically that there is a direct cause and effect relationship. It's not like having your leg blown off by a cluster bomb. If that happens, you don't, you don't need to argue about cause and effect. Um, what happened in Vietnam was as much on the American side a political uh, as much as a scientific decision which was that there was a presumptive association between having been in Vietnam during the war years and having developed one of an increasingly large list of diseases that came to be prevalent among veterans. So politically, there was a lot of guilt involved in that. There was a lot of feeling like America had done very poorly by its veterans, didn't want to think about the war. But of course, the benefit of the doubt was never extended on the Vietnamese side. And there was always that excuse to fall back on, well, you know, where, where would you even start? And that leads us really to the 1990s, where small numbers of scientists on both sides have wrestled with that question. And then in 1990s, after Vietnam began a process of opening to the West, an economic reform program, tourists began to go, people began to see disabled kids on the streets, you know, a certain amount of awareness grew. And it also became a place where people wanted to do business. They wanted, Vietnam wanted to attract foreign capital, foreign companies came in. And to me, the pivotal period of the story that I tell in my book is when a group of Canadian scientists came in. The, the Americans I've mentioned, many of them were still working on this issue. Uh, one of them, a man called Arnold Schechter, had done a certain amount of research on places like Bin Hoa, next to Long Bin that Heather was talking about. Uh, but they hadn't ever really discerned patterns. They'd done isolated testing. They'd shown there were clusters of disease. But this group of Canadian scientists came in um, really with a mixture of idealism and they were looking for business. They were environmental experts. They were scientists with a company in Vancouver called Hatfield Consultants, and their specialty was dioxin. They'd worked and built their reputation on removing dioxin from paper mills in British Columbia, which were contaminating the waterways and the fish and shellfish in, in those areas where there were paper mills. So they turned up in Vietnam and they said, we have this expertise, 
what do you need? Is there anything we can do to help? And they were introduced to the leading scientists of the group that I mentioned earlier, who by this time were part of a Vietnamese government organization called the 1080 Committee, founded in October 1980. That's why I got the name. Well, they had this problem. They said, we need to do, what we want to do is a comprehensive study to track everything that happens from the moment these chemicals are sprayed from the tank on the aircraft, land on the ground, go into the soil, go into the water, and end up causing human health problems. So where do we do that? And they were taken around by Dr. Le Kao Dai, who had run the field hospital I mentioned during the war and had treated liver cancer. And they looked and they found a lot of the places, like if you went to, if you go to Binh Hoa or Long Binh or any of the sprayed areas around there now, it's completely urbanized. Um, areas that were forested and sprayed have been dammed for hydropower, they're underwater. Uh, mangrove forests that were sprayed in the delta are now all replanted or turned into shrimp farms or just suburban sprawl. So where could you go? And they found this place right up on the demilitarized zone on the Ho Chi Minh Trail on the Lao border called the Aloy Valley or the Ashaw Valley. Very famous to Americans because it's the site of Hamburger Hill particularly important place in the war, big stronghold of the North Vietnamese inside the South. And Dr. Le Cao Dai and his associate, Dr. Hoang Ding Cao, who had served there during the war, said, well, let's look at this valley because dioxin can come from many sources. It can come from incinerators, it can come from cement factories. They said the beauty of studying it here, first of all, there's been no infrastructure development since the war. It's totally rural, it's indigenous people, it's farming communities, it was massively sprayed, and there's no industry. There's no other possible sources. You find dioxin there, there's only one way it could have come, and that's from the spray planes. So they took this isolated area in the late 1990s and worked there for three years, three and a half years, and essentially, they did a soup to nuts study. And they showed for the first time, they coined the phrase, this is a manageable problem. They got, a, they got their arms around the problem in a way no one ever had. And they showed that even though countless hundreds of thousands of acres had been sprayed, the spray had dissipated from the soil. It had dissipated from the surface, from the leaves, from the trees. That was not a problem because the myth had been, you know, every square inch that had been sprayed must still be contaminated. Well, it wasn't. So they ruled that out. And they narrowed it down to what they called a hot spot. And that was the site of an old American special forces base in the Alloy Valley called Asha, which had been used to store and spray Agent Orange. And the ground around that base was very, very heavily contaminated. So they said, okay, Let's narrow down how you deal with the problem of residual dioxin contamination of the land. And then they turned to the people. How did it get into the kids? How did it get into the bodies? How was it transmitted? They sampled everything they could find. Fish. These are people who live very heavily on a fish diet because they turn the old bomb craters into fish ponds. So they sampled fish, mollusks things that grew in ponds, snails, uh, beef, pork, chicken, leafy vegetables, you name it. They tested everything. And they found that because of the way dioxin works, it builds up in fat tissue, fatty tissue, and it concentrates in things like fish and ducks. So they said, okay, we can pinpoint how it gets into the food chain and how it accumulates in the food chain and passes into the human body. And the particularly sad part of this story, which also gave the clue to how you could address the question of second and third and now even fourth generation disabilities, is that a particular place where dioxin settles in the body, because it's a very fatty place, is breast tissue. And the heaviest concentrations they found were in 
human breast milk. That's how it was going into the kids. So there were a lot of insights in those studies that they took to the American ambassador, Pete Peterson, in the year 2000. Diplomatic relations had been restored three years earlier. Peterson was a pretty popular figure, um, quite a humane guy, former prisoner of war. He listened to the presentation these scientists gave, and he said, well, you guys have given me a really big political problem. And that's really the springboard, I think, for perhaps the rest of our conversation where Susan can come in a lot more. You know, how did you deal with that problem now that you had an actual scientific basis for understanding it? You couldn't run away from it anymore. This is how it worked. This is who it affected. And this is where it came from, the spray planes. So you had to address two things. One was the people whose health was affected. And one was the hot spots that were still contaminated like the big Bienhua Air Base that was mentioned earlier, where the dioxin was still heavily present in the soil and in the water and in the food supply. So those are the two big issues. And really everything that follows for the last 25 years is how you address those issues having understood them. We could spend all night talking about the various stages of that process. It's been extremely complex. It involves a new cast of characters from both sides, American, Vietnamese, and these Canadians who played such a crucial role. And eventually through the work of, of Susan and Jackie and their colleagues, it also led the path to one of the great remaining secrets of the war, which was that it was also heavily used in Laos. As I said, the Asha Valley, the Aloy Valley is right on the Lao border on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And the work that Susan and Jackie will talk about has been concentrated right on the other side of that border, inside Laos. And we've been able to show, largely through their efforts, how heavily Agent Orange was sprayed on the Laos side too, and how Laos, even if in a lesser degree, faces many of the same problems, the same characteristic patterns of disease that Vietnam has been struggling with. For, for all those years. So I want to just, you know, pay tribute, first of all, to the Fund for Reconciliation and Development for the years where it brought the scientists together on both sides, and then to the work that the War Legacies Project has done with Susan and Jackie and their colleagues um, to sort of bring that into the next generation of the, of the debate. Thank you. Um, yeah, so th as uh, George was saying, there was, we could go over many hours of the very dark years when the U.S. government and the Vietnamese government were um, trying to find a way to cooperate mm -hmm. on this issue. And a lot of it, of course, was dragging the feet by the U.S. government because there was a lot of concerns about legal legal responsibility um, for this problem. And how do you, the, how do you, um, particularly when it came to the human health aspects, the work of Hatfield enabled um, the, the U.S. and Vietnamese to define the problem of certain hot spots that they could work together on. It took a lot of work. And one of the ways that we finally reached this agreement is that we had support in Congress through Senator Leahy and Tim Reeser to address this particular war legacy issue. And thankfully, um, you know, I'm a Vermonter, so I'm very proud of my, my former senator. Um, on the Foreign Appropriations Committee, once the U.S. and Vietnamese got to this point where they could talk about Agent Orange and, and start focusing on a productive way to address particularly the environmental side of the story, they, Senator Leahy was able to put funding, begin to put funding into the appropriations process um, for the two governments to work together to first starting with the Da Nang Air Base to clean up that and then the, the Bien Hoa Air Base. But the human health aspect of this issue was really a struggle for us, those of us working on this issue for, for many years, because um, as was uh, George mentioned earlier, the research that the Vietnamese scientists had done, had been they had been accused of just spreading propaganda. In fact, there's a famous memo that came out of the Peterson Embassy of just that, that, that the Agent Orange issue was just propaganda, that the Vietnamese wanted to use it as a way to get war reparations that they had 
signed off on during the negotiations to normalize relations. And of course, the, at this point, the, the the U.S. veterans were receiving benefits from the VA um, for their um, health, some of their health conditions. They still had to fight for every one that they got, but they were receiving some government assistance um, for their health problems. And if they had a child with spina bifida, that, that child would receive some benefits too. And for those of us working on this issue, and of course the Vietnamese who were had children who were born with distinct, with severe disabilities, some of the children that Heather showed some photos of, this hypocrisy was just too hard for us to deal with and for them to deal with. And when the U.S. and Vietnamese kept, or the U.S. government kept dragging their feet on, on addressing the human health side of the, the problem, the Vietnamese themselves joined together and formed the Vietnam Association of Victims of Agent Orange, and they sued the U.S. chemical companies that had produced these chemicals. Um, unfortunately, the lawsuit did not succeed. The, the suit was filed in uh, 20, uh, 2004, and it went to the same court, the same judge that the, the, the U.S. veterans lawsuit had um, been under, which was Jack Weinstein's court in New York. And that lawsuit in 1984 famously settled out of court and was one of the largest settlements at its time. But when this new case came um, to Jack Weinstein's court, that his his ruling was that as chem, uh, as, as um, government contractors, the U.S. chemical companies were immune to lawsuit, and because the there was another part of this case that was an Alien Tort Claims Act case. He ruled on that aspect that because the chemicals were not used to poison people, it was not a war crime. Um, but though the court case failed, it did raise immense attention around the world to the problem of Agent Orange in, in Vietnam. You would, at this, this time, we're talking, you know, 20, 2004, 5, 6, 7 time period. You could, you know, you would, any time Vietnam would be mentioned you, you, in an article at that time, it was often talking about um, the impact of Agent Orange on the people of Vietnam. New York Times, Washington Post, Vanity Fair even had a spread um, in their magazine about this issue. And even that this comic strip, Mary Worth, had a had a, a two or three week period where they discussed the age, impact of Agent Orange on the people of Vietnam. You couldn't, it became a you know basically a household name um, around the world. And this is also when organizations like uh, in, in France, the um, Vietnam Dioxin Organization formed and, and here in the U.S., the uh, Vietnam Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign. A lot of the uh, anti-war activists in Europe in particular who had formed these friendship organizations with Vietnam bound, uh, got together. And this really got to the point where the U.S. could not ignore the human health aspect of this anymore, even though they never, there was still, um, never, they never really took responsibility and never really admitted that dioxin was causing these human health problems. But thanks again, thanks because we had Senator Leahy and Tim Reeser who cared not just only about the cleanup aspect, they wanted to make sure that the human health impacts um, were also addressed and put language in the appropriations bill that many of us working on this issue, including Charles Bailey, who was at the Ford Foundation, who really um, uh, spearheaded a lot of our, our work on this as well, kept we kept pushing the language in the appropriations bill to get it more targeted to address people in Vietnam in the sprayed areas uh, where Agent Orange was sprayed who had severe physical and developmental um, cognitive disabilities and to, to really pushing the pushing the language so that it wasn't just money from appropriated from the US government for disabilities in general, but it was really targeted at the population that the Vietnamese would say they are an Agent Orange victim. Um, and so it took a long time to, to get to this process. Um, but and not enough really, in my opinion, has been done yet to address all of those needs. I work um, with the Vietnam Red Cross in Quang Nam province, and we have a project that's funded by 
started uh, is funded by the family of a Vietnam veteran who was stationed at Binh Hoa, and he died of his own Agent Orange related illness. And as he was dying in 2006, his wife and Bob Feldman, the, the veteran's name, wanted some U.S. government money to go to Vietnam to help people who've been impacted by Agent Orange. And the funding that we provide goes um, directly to families who have severe chil children with severe disabilities, um, because these are some of the poorest of poor in, in Vietnam. We, we talk to mothers who, who spend hours of each day just uh, preparing the food for their children, feeding them, cleaning them. Um, they have no time to work in the fields, no time to have another another job. It's all encompassing to care for a child with these severe disabilities who are uh, bedridden and unable to um, function, you know, uh, do do any self care. And so it's that a lot of the advocates, people who are advocating on this issue now, are trying to push the government to U.S. government funding to really get to those class of people, those with the most severe disabilities. Um, and you know, thankfully, you know, though we have had great success, thanks again to Senator Leahy and Tim, right now the U.S. government provides about, I think it's 30 million a year for the health side of, of this uh, human health side of the problem. The Pentagon contributes 15 million a year to clean up the Binh Hoa Air Base and another 20 million comes out of the foreign operations bill for the cleanup. And I I would really like to see that uh, increase that goes, an increase in the amount of money that goes to the disability side of the question and make the Pentagon, who is responsible for this, to up the, the money that they're providing um, for the uh, for the cleanup. Um, and, you know, it's we have to be grateful, I guess, you know, we are grateful for that, this funding over the past almost uh, 20 years now that has been given by the U.S. government for this issue. But the total, I, I, if I did the calculations right, and Tim, I know who's on this call, can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been about $531 million since um, funding is going to clean up as well as victim assistance. And I did the calculation of the total cost of the war in Vietnam which is in today's dollars, about a trillion dollars. That's a two to three days. That 561, 561 million dollars is the cost of about two to three days of waging the war. So I would really like to see the US government put more money in addressing the legacies of the war than they, uh, at least part, a higher percentage than they're putting on waging war. Um, and as a uh, George mentioned, um, we now um, trying to answer uh, the problem, uh, the question of how many people in Laos have been impacted by by Agent Orange, because it's very different in, in Vietnam. I mean, in Laos, we didn't they don't have the many scientists they, they that had been researching this issue since the war. They didn't have the um, they themselves, the, the Lao government, were not exposed um, exposed to the Agent Orange during the war. The people who have been exposed were those along the Ho Chi Minh Trail that were remote ethnic minority groups. So it's a very different um, uh, approach to this issue in Laos than it is in, in Vietnam. And thankfully, we had Jackie, who knows Laos very well, who's been able to help us um, try to begin to answer these questions in Laos. So Jackie. Thank you very much, Susan, for that um, summary. <clears throat> um, I must say that uh, I have a slight cough, and so I'm going to probably be turning some of this over to my daughter to read the script <laughs> that I put together. Um, and also, George, I want to thank George for mentioning Dr. Ton Tat Tung and, and all the other doctors that we met. My first um, uh, immersion into the Agent Orange issue was when I went to Vietnam. I was working with uh, International Voluntary Service. And I was the administrator. And, and one day I found an awful lot of 
the grass in front of the building was full of this liquid that was coming in from the airport. Subsequently, long after this, I realized they were dumping the chemicals from the Agent Orange into this area and it was coming right into the yard. Um, so not only was it impacting on the very, very poor people who were sitting in front of our, our um, area and they were very poor and they were Vietnamese who had very little money and they were complaining that their children were getting very sick. That was my first really strong introduction and I, I never forgot it. But now move forward. My, uh, my daughter, Miranda Rump, is sitting next to me here. Um, she, uh, I, I, I believe today that she has been impacted by that, that what I was impacted. And uh, I breastfed fed her for 13 months, uh, nonstop, because we had just arrived in Laos and I wanted to make sure she was healthy. And she soon kept getting very, very ill. There were three times when she was extremely ill and almost died. I have now pieced together the puzzle of Agent Orange. And I do believe that uh, she was impacted from my breast milk. As we learned earlier um, in the statement by George, it comes through breast, breast milk. So this is one of the reasons why she's very healthy today. She's very smart. She's very helpful. Um, and, uh, but, uh, I think often of all the children that we work with every single time I'm meeting another child, I am, I am crying for them. Um, they don't get the services that they deserve. So now we're trying very hard to uh, keep uh, people in Laos more aware of what happened to the people who live along the border of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, my first uh, uh, time when I, I, I figured out that uh, something was going on was when I had a job uh, appointment in, in uh, Seikong district. And Seikong was a very tiny little place with just one little tiny hospital. And the mothers kept coming to me and telling me their stories of their babies who were getting very sick. And they took me to see them. And um, the only thing I could think of was, were they impacted by Agent Orange? Well, grateful, I'm very grateful that the that the team from Canada came and they eventually helped us um, to identify that there was a spot up in the mountains where um, uh, our troops had been there. And then they found later the, the uh, barrels uh, much later, they found the actual barrels where that were brought in and that the that were used in in uh, at that time on the top of the hill. Um, these these people had no idea what was going on, why their children were living. And one woman had had five different children die within a few months and uh, she I believe that she was um, impacted and and had serious problems. So um, the the War Legacies project has been, I think, uh, a help to these people. But a major problem for us is always that the people, local people, 
uh, don't have very good access to hospitals. And it takes a lot of energy for people to take their child on a motorbike very often into town to pick up some funding from us that then they can get on a bus and take the child into uh, the bigger towns. And this has become a very difficult process. Uh, sometimes you're, I, I'm watching these kids on the back of the motorbike and I'm always thinking, I hope they don't fall off that bike. There is no services out there for uh, addressing this. And this is something I think that the United States will start thinking about these, these children. Um, right now, in our last, we've done several survey levels. The first survey level that we had was um, way back uh, in 2018. I'm asking my daughter to remember. Um, 2018, uh, my colleague Nipapon and I started to look for some of the children that were um, in the areas that we were that I've just talked about, and we found so many that it was disturbing. Um, today we have found over five hundred children in our latest survey work. Hmm? Five survey, huh? Five survey. Five five thousand five hundred in the first in the first in the first one in the first year, five hundred children we found within the first year of our work. Now, we have found another. What is it? We're looking up our statistics. Four hundred eighty, almost five hundred. Four hundred and eighty. Thank you. Four hundred and eighty. <clears throat> and. Uh, how are we going to help all of those? And the, the total runs very high. And there's the services are very, very needed. Um, Lao people, uh, are, there are many different ethnic groups. So when you go into this area where, where I have been working for now, it's at least uh, uh 45 years in Sekong area and all around that area. Um, these are people who rarely get outside of their villages uh, because they don't have the funds. Uh, they have great difficulty getting to any services that even we provide. So I think that it, one of the things that we have to think about is how do we how do we change this? Um, we we were about to. Um, I can't. I can't. I'm getting dry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I I can add a few things here, um, Jackie, if you want. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then we'll get into Q and A. Um. Yeah, we were able, after the survey, I mean, one of the questions that we didn't have answered in Laos is, as, uh, were the same types of birth defects that you would find across the border, just, you know, a few kilometers away in Vietnam found in the population sprayed in Laos. And our survey work was able to show this. And thankfully, we had George who took uh, a trip with us and was able to write an article that was in the New York Times magazine that um, described our survey work, described the, our findings in such a, you know, a, a very compelling way that we could use that to advocate with um, Senator Leahy and Tim in Washington to sit, you know, show that, yes, we are probing, uh, finding the same types uh, of conditions. And um, right, one of Senator Leahy's last appropriations was to put in um, funding to ad address people with disabilities um, in uh, the sprayed regions of, of Laos. And it has now been well, three, I think, years since that uh, appropriations went through. 
And just this year, that funding has been programmed to World Education that will expand a project that they're doing on disability work in Laos to three of the districts that were sprayed um, by herbicides. Now this will, and, and to provide disability services, train uh, rehabilitation um, specialists, um, build up the hospitals so that um, ideally, and at least in those districts, the people who have, that we are finding with these severe physical disabilities do not have to get on that bus and go all the way to Vientiane. The services can be provided to them more locally. Um, but as in Vietnam, as in, in Laos, the, we appreciate the U.S. funding greatly, but it reaches a very small proportion of the population that is impacted. Um, so much more needs to be done. Um, both, I mean, particularly Laos has very few well-trained, has very few trained doctors. Um, unlike in Vietnam, it's have, have quite a, you know, quite a few more, but it's, it's a lot of um, really building up the health system to address these people with, with disabilities. And that takes funding. Um, those of us who do this, um, you know, most of the work we're doing now is funded as a result of George's article, Average Americans Donated. Um, Bob, you know, our work in Vietnam, Bob Feldman's family donated. And we recently had donations from Susan Gregory, who I believe is on this call in memory of Rennie Davis to do this work. But that that's funding is greatly appreciated and we can put it right to work, but we need the large resources. And we had great support from Senator Leahy and Tim. I'm a little worried about going forward, but I see Tim has joined the call. Maybe he can ease those concerns a little bit, maybe. Tim? Can you hear me? First of all, uh, let me say that uh, I think this has been a really superb discussion. Thanks very much, John, for getting everyone together. George, that was a such a good summary. And uh, Susan and Jackie and Heather just really, I think, has illustrated how each of you have made it possible, really, for, in my case, uh, myself and Senator Leahy to actually try to act on the information that you have given us over all these years, as well as Charles, who was absolutely indispensable when he was at the Ford Foundation uh, in, as George described, identifying the scope of the problem in a way that was manageable from our perspective. Uh, previous to that, uh, we didn't really have any idea of what we were dealing with and if it really was true that the entire country was contaminated, how we would possibly uh, attempt to address it. So, you know, the work that all of you have done in both documenting uh, the scope and nature of the problem and publicizing it uh, was really invaluable to us. We, we couldn't have gotten to first base if we hadn't had that uh, to rely on. Um, you know, my own, I, I was old enough to be drafted uh, in 1970. But by that time, uh, although war was still very much uh, happening, I got a high lottery number. So I was never at risk after that. Uh, but, you know, I never imagined that I would ever be able to do anything about what had happened in Vietnam, even though we had all heard about Agent Orange uh, among all the other atrocities that happened there. Uh, and it was only thanks to my work with Senator Leahy that I found myself uh, in a position to actually act on what uh, Susan and Jackie and Charles and then George documented. Um, but in the beginning, as, as George described, it was very difficult. I ran into very strong resistance 
at both the Pentagon and the State Department. And, and yet, while we had, Senator Leahy started to work to address other legacies of the war, particularly the, the UXO problem, unexploded bombs and mines, and the people who had been severely injured. Um, whenever I had a conversation with the Vietnamese uh, about the work that we were doing and the progress that we were making, albeit slow, they always brought up Agent Orange and were very angry and resentful about it and the fact that the United States had never done anything to address it. And at the time, you know, there wasn't much I could say in response other than that I agreed with them that we had a responsibility, we had caused this problem. Uh, if it were to occur today, it would almost certainly be considered a war crime. And that the consequences, as Heather described, um, were, were uh, obviously uh, something that we should try to address. But I, I ran into great resistance uh, from the lawyers at the Pentagon and the State Department uh, who were very worried about legal liability and and emphasized as Charles or rather George described that there was no proof of the causal effect of dioxin contamination and the uh, birth defects and other uh, injuries that we were seeing, disabilities that we observed. Uh, and it was really only until they finally agreed to uh, compensate American veterans who had been affected, who had to fight for years, uh, as Heather described, to get recognition. It was only at that point that the obvious double standard could no longer be defended. And I was able to get them to begin to uh, accept the argument that we had a responsibility not only to our own veterans and their families, but also to the Vietnamese who were uh, in much larger numbers affected. And, you know, over the years, uh, we've made a lot of progress in that an issue that began as a source of real antagonism has now become one in which we are cooperating very closely with the Vietnamese, both to address the needs of people and families, as uh, Susan described, very poor families who, who uh, in some instances, spend 24 hours a day caring for their children or uncles or aunts or brothers, etc., cetera, um, as well as trying to address the contamination initially at Da Nang, as Susan said, and now at Bien Hoa. Um, da Nang alone required uh, over $110 million from the United States. And it was a project that we really didn't know uh, whether it would succeed. It was on a scale that USAID had never undertaken before in a foreign country. The technology was quite new, uh, but it did succeed. Uh, Senator Leahy got all of that money through the appropriations bill. And, and then we began to undertake a much larger project at Bien Hoa, and that is still ongoing, but uh, we fully expect that it will be uh, completed within the next several years and that the funds will be provided um, to that end. Um, there are other contaminated former U.S. air bases in Vietnam. They're much smaller. Uh, most of them, I think, are ones that can be managed by the Vietnamese themselves, but 
I also think that there may be a need for us to be helpful in some of that as well. Uh, on the disability side, and it's really largely thanks to the relentless advocacy of Charles, uh, we have expanded the programs that initially started with just one in Da Nang to now a total of 10 provinces. And uh, I just met with Kavan Tran yesterday about uh, the Vietnam Assistance for the Handicapped uh, projects that are going to begin in two of the Delta project uh, provinces uh, funded by USAID. Um, Susan, is, Susan is absolutely right that it is not nearly enough, uh, but it is, it is in some ways uh, a model for what should occur um, in uh, the aftermath of wars when too often governments just walk away uh, and do nothing. Uh, to try to address these types of legacies that affect uh, generations um, afterwards. And, and so while we have a lot more to do, and I think uh, it's been a struggle because, as Charles knows better than anyone except perhaps myself, uh, USAID, while it's, you know, the implementing uh, agency and a has been, we've had, you know, very good people at times at the U.S. mission in Hanoi. It also has been a struggle for us to ensure that the funds go to assist the people who are most in need, as uh, Susan mentioned. Um, we don't have a lot of money given the scope of the problem, and we want to ensure that it's used uh, to assist those who really are the most severely disabled and their families. And that has not always been the case. And it's an ongoing uh, battle for us to monitor how these funds are used and ensure that they are most effective. So, you know, I think that on the plus side, we've come a long way for sure in addressing uh, one of the worst legacies of Vietnam, particularly when you think of where we started, uh, when there was such resistance. Um, but we also have uh, a long way to go, uh, particularly on the disability side, because that's going to continue. Um, you know, we'll finish the Bien Hoa Air Base cleanup project. Uh, we may end up working in some of the smaller former bases like Foucault, but we we also know that as far as the disabilities piece, um, for the foreseeable future, we have to continue those programs. Uh, and we may have to expand them further to other provinces as well. We've had some challenges because Vietnamese organizations really don't have the capacity that they need to effectively uh, carry out these programs. And we want to empower local organizations to do that. And there's there's been some success, but it's not been as, as much as we would have liked. Um, we also, as was mentioned, Jackie and Susan, you know, have tried to uh, get USAID to uh, address this issue in Laos. It's been an excruciatingly slow process, um, in part because, frankly, the Laotian government hasn't been terribly um, responsive. And, you know, we can't work in a country unless the government wants us to. And uh, our relations with Laos are not nearly what they are with our relations with Vietnam. And so um, it continues to be a work in progress, I would say, to uh, put it mildly. But I, I think that at least we've now 
gotten something started. Um, we also would like to uh, at least uh, although we've tried, we'd like to work with the Laotians to get permission to do some surveys at uh, some of the sites where Susan and Jackie have identified as perhaps uh, there is uh, dioxin contamination. We don't know um, whether there is, but there certainly could be. And, and we'd like to be able to at least know one way or the other, but we haven't yet got uh, permission from the Laotian government to do that. In the meantime, we're trying to at least um, uh, get support to families in these provinces that were heavily sprayed. So, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, I, I never thought in a million years I would be able to do anything about what happened in Vietnam. It was uh, a period that I lived through, as uh, some of you did. Um, uh, but it's you know, for me, been one of the perhaps the most rewarding uh, experiences of working with Senator Leahy over the last 37 years. Now I'm working in the office of uh, his successor, Senator Welch, uh, and we're continuing um, to carry on that legacy. Um, I'm no longer working on the Appropriations Committee, but um, I basically hired everyone on the Democratic side. Um, uh, handling appropriations uh, for these types of programs. So, you know, I'm reasonably optimistic, even despite um, the results of the recent election, that uh, there is and will be continued bipartisan support for these programs because people understand that it's it's not just about dealing with the legacies of the war and the people who were affected, but also it's integral to uh, building a new relationship with Vietnam and promoting cooperation on a whole lot of other things uh, that both countries uh, have an interest in. So in that sense, it was these programs that opened the door to rebuilding our relations with Vietnam and and I'm hopeful that for that reason, even though people today in Congress and particularly the staff don't share my experience, they weren't they're not old enough to have lived through that time, um, that they will uh, at least continue to support these programs for the foreseeable future. Uh, it does require continued advocacy. Uh, and, you know, there's turnover in these offices. So it means educating people and explaining why this is important, why it still matters, even though it happened a long time ago. Um, and, you know, that's the job of all of us. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, I like that you keep saying we because I was really fearful that after the election, you were going to fly right out of um, Washington and come back to lovely Vermont. So I'm hoping you'll stay on for a while. Well, we'll see. There's certainly uh, plenty to do. Certainly. Um, John, I see that you added Charles. So I, I'm assuming this means you want him to um, chime in. Uh, there have been people questioning, who is this Charles Bailey that we keep uh, <laughs> mentioning? So, Charles? It is I. Um, <laughs> I couldn't be more honored than to say, be in a group. Say who he is, Susan. Give give a little uh, bio about who he, what he did, and then. Well, so I, I think uh, Tim mentioned it. The um, formerly at the at the Ford Foundation for what, a decade or more. I can't remember the the number of years, but um, very instrumental on on many fronts. Um, funding. Um, while at Ford, a lot of the Hatfield studies and then funding many uh, organizations, including my own, uh, full disclosure, to raise awareness about Agent Orange and the impacts in Vietnam um, and strong advocate um, and always in the ears of Tim and Senator Leahy on what we think needs to be done. So, Charles. 
Uh, thank you, Susan. I was going to say I, <clears throat> I didn't anticipate it, but it's even more a pleasure to be in the same virtual space with all of you who we have shared so many values and travels in together for many, many years. George has become the excellent communicator and the person with depth of journalistic insight into all, as, as you've just heard. Heather has kept us ever mindful of the impacts on our own veterans and their families and the dramatic parallels with the Vietnamese as with your photos in the, um, uh, the photos of the, of the children, the young adults, the adults now with, with uh, hands and missing fingers. And of course, Jackie, for your work in, in Laos, which I know less, but I certainly heard so much about and uh, John, who um, maybe pred certainly predates me and many of us in his concerns for reconciliation and bringing people together over many, many years, right down to the present. Susan needs no introduction, uh, <laughs> but she has mobilized funds herself. It's rather easier to work for a foundation than to go out on the street asking for, for money and, uh, and, and, and delivering it in person to people in, in need. Uh, her story of the woman and the well is a kind of classic on how to help people. And of course, Tim and Senator Leahy, without Senator Leahy and Tim, there would have been, I think, no U.S. response to Asian Orange in Vietnam, even now. So the fact that we're all here and talking about it and talking about the future is a tribute to Tim's work and to uh, Senator Leahy, and uh, we wish she were 20 years younger and still in the Senate, mm -hmm. and maybe 30 years younger, and then we could get a proper run up to bringing this to an end. Um, I also have to say about Tim, I think, uh, <clears throat> as you probably know, I take notes in meetings, and Tim is so articulate and clear-minded that I never managed to quite keep up with my scribbles as to exactly mm -hmm. what he writes, what he others so effortlessly, and that is true this, this evening again. I just want to say, aside from just sharing friendship and determination about the future, is um, I had the pleasure last night to be uh, Washington State time uh, on a panel with, um, in, uh, I'm getting a message to please recharge my headset. Anyway, uh, the panel at the uh, lecture uh, that Dr. Nguyen <clears throat> excuse me, Nguyen T. Nok Phuong gave. And uh, I mentioned that in the chat because uh, we, we are all mindful that this is centered in Vietnam with important pieces of it in the US. But she continues in it to represent a a, a viewpoint which is very common among Vietnamese and is not stated by government officials. And um, I had five minutes and I won't bore you with what I said, but I quoted two things from her speech. Um, the scars left behind are not just on our lands, but etched into the very fabric of our society, our families and our bodies. And I began to think about that and began to think this is about the single best statement of the impacts on that country uh, today. And it, this has, this, these words have a lot in it. Later on, she talks about, <clears throat> makes another point, the victims of Agent Orange Dioxin and their families aren't just figures on a page. They're real people, real lives, each with their own struggles and stories. And this is something that in all of the strategizing, mobilizing of money, assessing of results, dealing with the media and so forth. It's so important to keep these people uh, front and center and increasingly to uh, find ways in which they can uh, lead the discussion. Um, finally, I'd just like to say that Dr. Fuang is in the tradition of all uh, Dr. Le Kaodai and Don Ta uh, Tung and other uh, leaders of the 1080 committee. I didn't realize until this time that in the 1980s, she was actually the vice chair of the National Assembly of Vietnam, Dr. Phuong, for 10 years. 
And for another five years, she chaired the Foreign Relations Committee of, of the National Parliament, the National Assembly. So this is, and while she was helping women give birth and doing research and so forth. So this is important to remember. She continues to call for compensation. She continues to make a very strong statement, not so much in this speech, uh, but throughout her life, she is saying, uh, we need recommend, we need to recognize this. And I think what she means is um, a US government, or anyway, an American response that acknowledges Hope's done, accepts responsibility, and and offers something of commensurate value, recognizing that the past can never be undone. Uh, what that might be, uh, she doesn't say, but it is a very clear strand of Vietnamese uh, thinking. And as I, um, this of course, this position contrasts strongly with the U.S. approach, which is a humanitarian approach, um, which has brought a lot of money to Vietnam, five, over $500 million to date. Um, and so I think that we need to think about how these approaches can be intertwined down the road. Maybe not, maybe we have to wait until 2028, but hey, they'll still be cleaning up Bien Hoa. Hopefully there'll still be money coming. And I think in the end, uh, maybe we can find a way, I have some ideas, all of you probably do too, in which these two strands, first deadlock, no discussion, then cooperation, technical cooperation, cleanup, disability assistance, and finally we can come together. We're not there yet. Um, I think um, it's certainly possible to say, make ex explanations for why it's been difficult, uh, which I needn't repeat, uh, but I think that's the direction we need to be thinking about. So thank you, John. Susan. Thank you very much, Charles. I know we've gone about 15 minutes over what we intended to do with this. Um, I tried to answer as many of the questions as I could in the, in the chat, um, but a lot of the questions can also be answered um, by uh, George's book, for one, by Charles's book, um, From Enemies to Partners, which is available on the Aspen Institute's website. I put, I put the link in there, but it might have only went to the person who asked the question. But if you Google Agent Orange, um, you know, Aspen Institute, Agent Orange, Enemies to Partners, it'll bring you right to the book and you can download that. It, it it's really tells this story in a nice in a nice way. And, um, and again, a lot of the the questions people had about, um, you know, proving that Agent Orange causes this, um, these birth defects. There's a lot of scientific debate over that. We believe the answer probably will be in what's happening in epigenetic studies. But the person, if you want to really dig deep into that, is is Google Linda Birnbaum, who was with the um, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and retired recently. She's now at Duke University as a um, adjunct professor. I'm not quite sure of her position there, but she is one of the experts when it comes to um, dioxin and um, uh, chemicals like dioxin that are, are um, hormone inhibitors. Um, you know, this it's really complex science there, but there's a lot of work that's starting to happen in this field. And in fact, I think the Nobel Prize just went to somebody who was doing um, re something related to, to these questions, not specifically dioxin, but looking at micro um, DNA. I can't remember exactly what his field was, but so that's a uh, uh, Google Linda Birnbaum if you, if you really want to dig, 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 dig deep into the science. Um, and then of course, reach out to um, any of us. Um, you can reach um, me. I don't know if John put any of the contact information on um, the uh, for us on the on the website. But if if not, you can um, reach out to John, who can connect you to me, or just Google War Legacies Project, and I can lead you to um, some of these um, uh, people to answer any further questions you might have. We also have a website called Agent Orange Record that was 
again, funded um, the development of that by um, the Ford Foundation grant we had many years ago. It's it's kind of a, a depository for a lot of the, the information. It needs some updating, as most websites do, but it's also a sort of a good summary of, of this issue. Um, so I want to thank everybody who joined today and all of the panelists and um, great to see all of you and hopefully we can get together in person soon. Yeah, if you want our time, come to Vietnam the last half of April for the 50th anniversary of, yeah. we call it the end of the war, they call it reunification. Mm -hmm. But well, first to thank everyone. Um, this was an extraordinary program and I think has uh, with the un unscripted additions of Tim and Charles, um, I think that this serves as a real documentary that adds depth. Uh, George's work, Susan's work, Jackie's work, and of course Heather's and her direct experience. Um, I hope this will for decades be a reference point for people who want to understand not just the issue, but why it was people caring about the issue that was so important. Um, so uh, we we will be sending out, as soon as I get it up, you'll get a link with the video and I hope you share it widely. Uh, it'll be a YouTube video as our other 30 programs are and I hope you share it to everybody that should have been here tonight and and didn't know about it or couldn't be um and uh i did put on the chat susan's email address all of the email addresses uh and the books uh didn't have charles book on there is george's is on the bios page but i'll add charles into the resource list um so that'll make it easy for people to find it uh and we will we will be back in in another month with another program and you'll get notified of it and the history is <laughs> each time we pick up another layer of the history i think we contribute to understanding the past and bringing about a better future. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, just to say that, you know, John, it may, really predates all of us uh, working on these issues. Uh, and uh, for reconciliation with Vietnam and, and highlighting these legacies uh, in ways that, you know, had had you not done so, I'm not sure you know, any of us would be here today. So um, it also is, you know, an illustration, I think, of how not that many people um, can sometimes uh, work together to address something that really, frankly, government should be doing, uh, but because they didn't and haven't until forced to, um, can really... Um, fill that vacuum and ultimately begin to force governments to take on their responsibilities for something that never should have happened in the first place. Uh, and Susan's note about how really the Department of Defense, having caused this problem, ought to be doing more, I couldn't agree more with. Um, that's been an ongoing conversation I've had with them and undoubtedly will continue to have with them. Uh, but the fact that they're doing something is important to recognize. It's just not nearly enough. And finally, I just want to mention that because uh, I think Jackie, or maybe it was Heather spoke about, or maybe it was Susan, I can't remember. But in any event, the, the lawsuits that were uh, attempted by the Vietnamese uh, but dismissed by uh, uh, courts in this country. Um, you know, I, I continue to believe that
the companies that were responsible for uh, providing the chemicals and the contaminated form that was uh, then used uh, bear a responsibility here. And many of them are uh, still doing business in Vietnam and profiting from their uh, activities in Vietnam. And it seems to me that they should be contributing. Um, they don't have to acknowledge liability. It's never been the issue for me. Uh, it's rather um, recognizing that they share responsibility and should be contributing <clears throat> to helping uh, the families that were affected as a result of their uh, negligence uh, in the way that the chemicals that were uh, used were produced. So I think there's still work to be done on that as well. Thank you. That's a good place to, to end this chapter in the multi-volume set. <laughs> Goodbye and good night. Indeed. Thank right. you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye. -bye. Good night.